Our next question is coming from Elizabeth. Elizabeth, where are you from and what's your question? Uh, yes, hello. I'm from Canada, Quebec, Canada. <clears throat> I remember reading something a while ago about vitamin D receptors on lymphocytes in that Vitamin D was important for immune function. And I, I was trying to find that re, that article, but I didn't. And I found another one that was published in 2016 about um, the study revealing an inverse association with a vitamin D levels and inflammation um, with the markers. And that was published in Archives of Medical Science in 2016. So I was wondering if you you knew anything about that, the vitamin D and in, immune function co uh, connection? Yeah. And that maybe, yeah. that, that maybe that was it, uh, uh, why vitamin D was important for, for many uh, physicians? Vitamin D is important for many physicians because they don't know how to read the medical literature. All right. So that, I'm just going to put that out. I, I, I'll tell you what, I said I was going to be a way to become a curmudgeon until I was 70 and I just never made it. All right. So I just say things like I mean, them, like I think they need to be said. Vitamin D, nobody on my side of this issue is saying vitamin D isn't important. Everything's important. There isn't a hormone your body produces that you don't need. The question is, do we benefit from all this testing and supplementation? And the answer is an overwhelming no. And so the first thing is vitamin D and inflammation, reverse causation. You're making my point. People with inflammation have lower vitamin D levels. People with COVID have lower vitamin D levels. Cancer, lower, it's reverse causation. You fix the problem, the vitamin D levels come up. We have inflated diagnostic parameters. And this, this reference range situation plagues everything. A lot of people don't realize that we have changed the definition of pre-diabetes, which is a non-existent disease. See, when they, when they ran out of people to give drugs to who had the real disease, they invented a new thing called the pre diabetes, pre-hypertension, pre-everything, right? Pre-osteoporosis. All right, so, so the, the, they've run out. So they now have um, set the, the parameters to the place where almost nobody over the age of 65 will show healthy on a fasting glucose test because the numbers have been set so low that I'm probably a type two diabetic, which is ridiculous, right? So, so that's what's happened with this vitamin D. So you have inflated reference ranges, you have reverse causation, which we know is the case, which is why the intervention and prospective trials have been so terrible, generally speaking. Um, and by the way, if you watch my video on Tuesday, I'm gonna cover this. People, after I covered vitamin D earlier this week, people became apoplectic and sent me this video by this UK PhD guy who I like, I've watched some of his videos, but he basically reports on a study where in a psychiatric hospital, they gave people horse-like doses of vitamin D and their plasma levels went up to between 118 and 374. And they looked at their calcium levels and they didn't become abnormally high. So they deemed it safe and effective. Effective for what? Effective for pretty, pretty blood work. You think the thing in psychiatric hospitals that'll make everybody better is knowing their vitamin D levels are off the charts, never been recorded before in the history of medicine. Is that what we're doing now? And, and this study, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I made another video about it. The people who sent this must not have watched the video and did not look up the original study because all it said was horse-like doses of vitamin D increase plasma levels and don't increase calcium. That's what it said, right? That's it. So anyway. Great. Um, I'm going to ask you a few questions on uh, on the microbiome. So you, you mentioned the, the microbiome. You talked about probiotics. What are other ways that we could improve uh, gut health? What are your thoughts on fermented, uh, on fermented foods? If you like them, eat them. If you never ate them, but you ate the right diet, you'd be fine. So people think that sauerkraut has like some kind of magical property. If you never had any sauerkraut, because in some places in the world, they have good microbiomes and they've never had the stuff, they're still fine. So that, that goes to, I never recommend the magical food approach. Like if you just consume this, all's good because there's no food that must be included in the diet. There is a dietary pattern to focus on. And um, is there any research though that shows that if you, you know, for people, you know, most Americans don't have a great microbiome and they want to rebuild it instead of having the over-the-counter uh, probiotic, could they have fermented food in instead in order to rebuild their their? Nope, because your body doesn't make the bacteria. These are rent. These bacteria are renting space from you. It's an exchange situation. I'm going to let you live here. I'm going to provide the food, and you get to see the world on me. 
all right, in return for that, but I got to provide the right food. In the return for that, you're going to control my immune system, keep me healthy, help me adjust food, and all those all those things that we know that the microbiome does. So you can't manufacture those critters. You've got to take them in externally. The appendix used to be the backup source, but now we've wiped out everything in the appendix. We take that organ out like it doesn't make any difference anymore. So you're going to have to take probiotics. Yeah, thank you. And is there a role? Um, of leaky gut in autoimmune diseases? Absolutely. Uh, and, and it comes from bad food. Alcohol is a leading cause. Uh, again, antibiotics and, and drugs that just destroy the microbiome, uh, constipation. Yeah. All right. Great. All right. Our next question is, oops, as soon as I find my window here, our next question is coming from Anatina. Where are you from and what's your question? Hi, thank you. Thank you for, I'm from New York. Thank you for working so hard and give us your sober and intelligent analysis of health issues. Um, back to vitamin D. Um, vitamin B being a hormone our body makes and gets activated through sun. Could all the supplementation down regulate our own production of this hormone? And we don't know. That, you bring up an interesting question. We don't know. Nobody knows. And, and nobody's interested in finding out because the horse is out of the barn. It's a multi-billion dollar industry and everybody knows. It's like every, the, medicine has many decades ago started um, really being a series of mantras. Safe and effective is a mantra. Early detection saves lives is a mantra. Everybody's vitamin D deficient is a mantra. And so people just repeat, there's a mind numbing um, mental disability that results from just repeating and repeating and repeating these messages until everybody knows that this is true. And the, I'm concerned about this vitamin D thing because we, we have no idea what the consequences are. I'm not the only person talking about it. Even the naturopathic community, there are some people saying we have jumped on this bandwagon and um, the biggest, without any knowledge about what the long-term consequences were going to be, the biggest consequence I see right now that we can all acknowledge is going on is people have been told sun is bad for you. You'll get skin cancer if you go out in sun. So you're going to slather on sunscreen to go get your mail and you're going to sit inside pale as a ghost and pop vitamin D pills and you'll be fine. That is ludicrous. Absolutely ludicrous. People And then you've got people saying, you got to give babies vitamin D because there's no vitamin D in breast milk. No, you got to take babies outside. That's how babies produce vitamin D. And the idea, you got a pale as a ghost baby in the house. Ridiculous, right? So I think the biggest immediate downside of this vitamin D nonsense is we're training people to stay inside and not get a tan. That's how you make vitamin D and you make enough to store it for the winter, because here's a news flash: we didn't used to have vitamin D factories back in the caveman days, right? Now, anybody wonder how humanity survived without all of this intervention all the time? It's kind of an interesting question, yeah. Great. But uh, since we uh, we need the sun for vitamin D activation, those people who live too far north and didn't have enough uh, uh, capacity to get loaded up in the sun during the summer. Wouldn't well, you there do. be a, a rationale? A, I mean, if you're living in an, an Arctic area, you know, the, the, the extreme climates, but they have problems that are bigger than vitamin D. The average lifespan of an Eskimo or Inuit living on a high fat diet is 20 years lower than a person living in a major city just a couple hours away eating cheeseburgers and french fries. Those people have bigger problems than vitamin D. It's an extreme method of living, and it doesn't really pertain to somebody like me who lives in Columbus, Ohio. And like I said, they, they have other problems besides vitamin D that shorten their life. Great. Thank you. And we got two minutes left. So I'm going to take one more question uh, from the audience. Lisa, where are you from? And what is your question? I'm from Jackson, Tennessee. My question, again, it kind of goes back to what you were asking about probiotics. You Pam, thank you again for your time. You recommend over-the-counter probiotics. But over and yeah. over again, we hear probiotics are ineffective and a waste of money and time. And it's just confusing because we hear one practitioner doctor say, you're wasting your time, get your probiotics through your food, your fiber, and then others say to take over the counter. So okay, well, it's in the interest of time, I'm going to answer your question. So, so the first thing is the studies are completely different, all right? 
And the first thing is understand that the average doctor who graduated medical school even 10 years ago knows nothing about probiotics. They know nothing about diet. They don't know how to read the medical literature, which is why we're having this discussion about vitamin D. I could talk to you about vitamin D until six o'clock tonight and not run out of things to show you that this is all a hoax. Okay. And if you re if you actually started reading this stuff on your own, you'll see what I'm telling you is true. All right. So, but the point that I'm getting at is when probiotics are the only intervention, all right, people keep eating cheeseburgers and French fries, remain dehydrated and overweight. You see the same, you see a beneficial effect. Now, if you can get a beneficial effect with a probiotic without changing anything else, take that probiotic in conjunction with discontinuing six times a year antibiotic treatment and fixing the sinuses so they don't constantly get infected, getting hydrated, eating a better diet, et cetera, et cetera, you're gonna amplify that effect. But it is simply not true that you can't find studies that show a positive effect from probiotics because the vast majority of them who have, that have been published actually do show benefit. Great, and with that, we're out of time. So thank you. It, it was really a wonderful experience talking to you. Um, and, and with all the information you shared, if we can unmute the audience, please. Thank you. 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 Thank you.